happy to be here. Always happy to talk about earthquakes. I wasn't planning to talk about volcanoes today, although we have some in our backyard too, and others, of course, all over the world. Uh, in the meantime, I'm looking at you, and I'm thinking, most of you grew up like me, thinking that the mountains were there because the earth was cooling, and so it was shrinking, and because the shell was getting too big, like an old apple, then you get mountains. But in the mid-60s, our thinking about that changed, and we developed the theory of plate tectonics, and it was a really nice theory because it explained a lot more things than the observations that we saw. So one of the things that explained was why are there earthquakes at the plate edges? Why are they not just spread throughout the whole earth more or less evenly? And we see here around the plate edges, particularly the ring of fire, there are lots of earthquakes. There's this swath of them cutting across southeastern Asia. There are some in Africa, and there are actually quite a few spread out through the middle of the oceans. And these are what we now call the plate margins. In between, we call them the plates, and there are mostly few earthquakes on the insides of the plates, except occasionally things like the 1811-1812 New Madrid earthquakes, which used to be considered the biggest earthquakes in the continent of the United States, but no longer. Science is always updating things like magnitudes, even if they're 200 years old. And what the plate tectonics theory tells us, and what we observe is there are three kinds of plate boundaries. The transform boundaries, like our boundary in California, like much of what we see in New Zealand, and like little segments along the ocean ridges, are where the plates are slipping past each other. So if we look down on it, we see one plate is going past the other plate, like cars passing on a road. We have a second type of boundary called the convergent boundaries, where the plates are coming together. And if it's an oceanic boundary, what happens is one of the plates goes underneath the other. And if it's a continental boundary, we're still working on exactly what happens. Probably one plate is going underneath the other one, but it's lifting it. The mountains are much higher. Um, the Himalayas are our major continental trans, uh, convergent boundary. And then there are divergent boundaries, plates, places where the plates are spreading apart. Most of the divergent boundaries are the ones on the mid-ocean ridges, like the um, Atlantic or the East Pacific rise. There's one entirely circling Antarctica. But there are a couple of places on land where we also have divergent boundaries. The Afar Triangle in, in Kenya is one of those places where we consider the plate surface to be spreading apart slowly and therefore um, becoming thinner and possibly not in our lifetimes rifting apart so that a, a separate continent will form somehow over here. The typical kinds of plate boundaries have their typical kinds of fault. The major faults at a, a transform boundary are strike-slip faults, like most of our faults in California, like the main faults in New Zealand, and like all of the faults at these ocean ridges. The second kind Boundary, uh, convergent boundaries have thrust or reversed faults, and the divergent boundaries have what we call normal faults. So the normal faults are called normal faults because the hanging wall, the uphill side, goes down. That's normal. Things go from up to down under the force of gravity. So that's what we call a normal fault. A thrust fault or reverse fault is called a reverse fault because the uphill side goes up. That's backwards, so we call it reverse. And the third type, the strike-slip faults, are because the slip is along the strike of the fault. So we call it a strike-slip fault. These pictures here show the 
kind of movement we see on a normal fault, the hanging wall, the uphill side goes down, the downhill side relatively goes up. We can't say which one is actually moving, it's always relative because there's, you know, if I'm standing on this side, clearly I'm not moving and the other side is doing whatever it's doing. But if somebody's standing on the other side, he's not moving or she. The reverse fault, the downhill side goes down, the uphill side goes up, and in a strike slip fault, the two sides just go past each other. Typically, no fault is exactly any one of these, although at the San Andreas fault, it's really pretty close. So we get some mixes, we could have a, a fault that's both strike slip and reverse, or both strike slip and normal, um, and that's typical. The other thing that's typical is that Reverse faults are the ones that make the biggest earthquakes. All of our magnitude 9 earthquakes have happened on reverse or thrust faults. Um, the Great Chile earthquake of 1960 was the biggest earthquake ever measured. It was magnitude 9.5. We don't think we can get anything much bigger than that. The four other biggest earthquakes were um, the 1964 Alaska earthquake, Good Friday, uh, magnitude 9.2, the Sumatra earthquake in 2004, which is a magnitude 9.2 also, and the Tohoku earthquake, which happened last uh, March, was a, a 9.0. There are a couple of others, I don't remember them because they haven't gotten as much press in that much time. So, those were all revert thrust faults, they were all at convergent boundaries. The biggest magnitude we expect from a stripe slip fault is maybe eight, eight and a half. And normal faults are probably smaller. And one of the reasons we think that that's the case is because the Earth is a sphere, and if you try and move things on the top of a sphere, pushing them together or taking them apart, eventually you run into more friction than you can overcome when the, the, the region of slip is so big. So just like when you skip your foot on the rug, it's not the whole rug that moves mostly. There's only a little section in front of your foot, and after that little section in front of your foot, it kind of, the, the bump in, that you produce dies out. Something like that. So the most recent, biggest earthquake that we had was the Tohoku earthquake. It got a lot of press. There were two really important things to say about it. It was the best measured earthquake ever. Because after the 1995 uh, earthquake in January, Kobe earthquake, the Japanese invested a lot of money in upgrading their seismic monitoring systems. And they put in uh, lots of broadband stations. They have more than more than a thousand seismic stations spread over their country. And they put in GPS stations everywhere to measure the movement of the fault. Or the movements of the faults there. So what happened in the Tohoku earthquake? It lasted about three minutes. The maximum slip was 40 meters. That's almost half a football field. That means if you were standing on one side of the fault, but you couldn't because it was underneath the ocean, and watching what happened to the other side, and you were imagining that was a football field, at the beginning of the earthquake, you and the 50-yard line would be together. And at the end of the earthquake, you and the 10-yard line would be together. That's a lot of movement. The area of the earthquake was about 300 kilometers by 150 kilometers. So that's a big earthquake. For comparison, the 9.2 Sumatra earthquake lasted 10 minutes. Again, what do you mean it lasted 10 minutes? Earthquakes are like zippers. They don't open and close immediately. Bang! The whole thing happened. No. They start at one end and they rupture to the other end, sort of the way you do with a zipper. And a 
magnitude 7 earthquake, if we imagine this like a pant zipper, it takes a short time to close. And a magnitude 8 earthquake then would be like a sweater zipper, takes a little bit longer. And a magnitude 9 earthquake would be like a tent zipper, that takes quite a long time to close the entire tent zipper. And the same way, the rupture of an earthquake takes time to happen. Most of the ones that we experience in California are the relatively small ones, and they're over in half a second or a quarter of a second. Those are the ones we notice. Okay, the maximum slip in this earthquake was less, 20, 25 meters, something like that. But the area of this earthquake was humongous. It was a 1,500 kilometers long. It was 1,000 miles long, the rupture of this earthquake and about 150 kilometers wide. So, um, in terms of our local earthquakes, the closest this comes to would be the 1906 earthquake, which took about a minute and a half to happen, and was also 300 kilometers long. But the difference is that it was only 15 kilometers wide. So one of the reasons that the subduction zone earthquakes can get bigger is because when you're pushing, let's see, okay, so you're pushing like this between the two plates. The Pacific plate is going west, the North American plate, which is what's still there in Japan, is going east like this, and you can have a huge length, width of the fault, in a region where earthquakes can happen. Whereas in California with the vertical faults, they can only happen in the crust. The crust is about 20 miles thick, and only the top part of that is stiff enough to have earthquakes. So about 10 miles of the crust can have earthquakes. In the case of a lot of movement, 15 miles of the earth can have crust uh, earthquakes. So the earthquake, the 1906 earthquake, was about 300 miles long and about 15 miles thick, or 500 kilometers and 20 kilometers thick for a comparison of the area. That's what makes part of the difference also between the strike slip and the thrust of the The wrong key. Okay, I said the Tohoku Oki earthquake was the best measured earthquake ever. This is a picture of the GPS point stations that the Japanese have installed, and they measure where they are and send that data to the central location every second and every 30 seconds. And what I have here is a movement, how do these GPS locations move as a function of time? So what the left side is going to show you is horizontal displacement. Where did it move in the north and east direction or the south and west direction? And the right one is going to show the up-down movement. The little arrows in the corner, this arrow, so if you see an arrow this long, it means that round, that spot, moved one meter. And you see this red arrow, it says if that spot moved, if it's, the arrow is that long, it moved half a meter. So. This is the movie. It starts before the earthquake. Come on. It starts before the earthquake. And then you'll see a spot appear here on the side. That's the earthquake epicenter. And then you'll see what movement was measured at these sites on land during the earthquake. And how did it stay? So this is a time lapse every half minute. What did the ground do? And in GPS, there's actually quite a bit of noise. So you see things kind of wiggling all the time a little bit. But these locations around the epicentral region, near the epicenter, they moved six meters on land. Up to six meters on land. You want to see it again? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Sorry, yeah, let's. That worked. 
time are we going to have one more time? Each of the dots are sensors? Each of the dots is a sensor. It's a GPS sensor like the one in your car, but because the analysis is done for all of them at the same time, we know to within a centimeter where they are and not to within several feet where they are at any given time. And that's the movement, movement at the surface. Uh, that's the movement at the surface, yes. But in the end, we can project back what has to have moved down there in order to make the surface move this much. And so the original map that I showed you of the rupture surface, sorry, have to get rid of this now. Uh, 26th, 
and we didn't have any earthquakes for it. So maybe that was your earthquake. And it turns out that that actually works pretty well. So we think the last earthquake on Cascadia was in 1700 on January 26th. And the average recurrence interval is 500 years. But the uncertainty is about 200 years. <laughs> so that means a big earthquake like this, I mean, it can happen at any time, but a big earthquake like the Japanese earthquake could happen now. And if it were to happen now, we would certainly feel the shaking too, because we're not much farther away from this than Tokyo was from the Tohoku earthquake, a little bit farther. We would feel shaking too. And, yes? beginning. infrastructure just wasn't ready for anything. 
That's why all of the people were killed. So I'm going to talk about the New Zealand earthquake. They got a lot of press at the same time. Remember, there was Chile, and then there was New Zealand, and then there was Japan. New Zealand was a relatively small earthquake. The first one was a magnitude 7. It happened actually where they didn't expect it, uh, west of Christchurch. It didn't do very much damage. It was a surprise. It ruptured this fault out here. But then in September, they had a second earthquake right underneath the city of Christchurch. And Christchurch is a lot like California. They have these strikes of faults, but they also have the kind of buildings that we have. They have the kind of infrastructure that we have. Some of it is new, some of it is old. Actually, quite a bit of it is old. Many things were built in the 60s and 70s. As we have earthquakes, we upgrade our uh, knowledge about what is likely to survive, and then we improve the new buildings that are built. But we don't necessarily do anything about the old buildings. And it was the same in Christchurch. Um, so this earthquake happened in the middle of the city. And then in June, there was another earthquake that happened in the middle of the city with lots of aftershocks. Am I going to learn to push the right one? So if this is, this is the city of Christchurch. This was the, ninth, the February earthquake looked like this. There was about two meters of slip maximum, six feet. Um, it didn't actually reach the surface as far as I know. The June 13th earthquake was perpendicular to it. This is stuff that we're learning about these earthquakes in more detail as we have good equipment, and they happen in places where we have the good equipment. That you could have a region where there's one fault that goes kind of in one direction, and then a second fault that goes perpendicular to it. Um, so there was damage to the cathedral, Downtown um, Christchurch, I think, is still closed because they're still discussing what they're going to do about the buildings that aren't safe to live in anymore. This is the kind of damage that you see in unreinforced masonry buildings everywhere. The front of the building falls off. But the really big um, damage in terms of residential areas was the liquefaction. Uh, Christchurch is built on a basin over sand, and the shaking from the earthquake caused all the sand to liquefy, and many of the streets were full of sand. They had, it broke all of the water pipes and the sewers, and the water pipes is bad, but the sewers is worse. And the way that the city of Christchurch dealt with this was they gave every household a porta potty. And the people had to go outside to use the facilities. But it meant that there was no big um, mess. 
infrastructure and the faults that go through the middle of the town. Which brings us back to our edge of the plate. In the Bay Area, we live on this transform fault. The Pacific plate is moving about two and a half inches relative. They always told me that this was how fast hair grows, but my hair grows faster than that. Um, maybe fingernails. So two and a half inches per year, the Pacific plate is moving relative to the North American plate. And we have several faults that run through the area. The San Andreas Fault is the um, most famous one. The Hayward Fault comes here at the base of the foothills. How many of you have gone to see the reconstruction at the stadium? Yeah, so if you haven't, there's a viewing point now where you can go and watch it as long as there's construction going on. So it's open from 7 in the morning to 7 at night or 9 at night. It's really fascinating. And the other thing to do is to go look at their webcam. They have one picture for every day of work since January 2011, shortly after they started. And that's also it's really fascinating. So right along the fault, of course. And the East Bay's main fault is the Calaveras Fault, which starts in Hollister and comes up. Um, the Hayward Fault splits off at about Mission Peak in San Jose. There are actually lots of faults in the Bay Area, and of course our history of earthquakes is limited by when white people got here and started writing things down. And the, um, so at 1700, 17, uh, 1776, San Francisco was founded, 1776. There have been earthquakes in that time, but and instrumentation started in 1887 here at Berkeley. The first instruments were installed. The first instruments worldwide were installed in the early 1880s. So we were among the earliest. The point was that that was more qualitative. Yes, it happened now, and this is the time it happened, but. We can't go back to those old records, at least many of them, and say, this is exactly how we knew the ground moved, and this was the maximum. So it's difficult to do a, a magnitude then. But we can look at the buildings that were around in the uh, mid-1800s and look at the damage to them. In particular, the adobes were a good example of buildings that got damaged every time there was an earthquake and they were repaired or not. The reports in the newspapers were also helpful, although it's not always possible to find the actual report, but this newspaper quoted that newspaper, which may have quoted that newspaper, and it's not clear how the story got changed from one newspaper to the other. So for the 1800s and early 1900s, we've been going back, looking at the reports, what did people see, what did people notice, what damage was present in order to determine how big were the earthquakes, what was the shaking like, and what was the magnitude. So this was the Amador Valley earthquake of 1861. Jack Boatwright has been looking at these old earthquakes, looking at the reports in the newspapers and at the damage reported on the adobes. And this one, we think, the epicenter was around Dublin, and that it ruptured the Calaveras Fault along here. Does anybody remember the Livermore earthquake in 1980? I was in Germany at the time, so I didn't notice it. So the, the big earthquake, the great San Francisco earthquake, happened in 1886, and it was it ruptured along the Hayward Fault, the southern segment. We think it only ruptured to Oakland. The city of Hayward was basically demolished, and there were one to two meters of slip along a section maybe 30 kilometers long. So it was probably about the same size as the Lower Creator earthquake, the length, the width, the total shaking involved. And it was called the Great San Francisco Earthquake because it caused some damage in um, in San Francisco, and it killed 
five people in San Francisco. It totally demolished the city of Hayward, which was why it was called the Hayward earthquake. And we found that, um, so the population was around 260,000. There were 30 fatalities, $350,000 damage. It was a lot of money then. And no houses were left standing. That was, of course, the great earthquake until the 1906 earthquake came and caused a lot of shaking, destroyed a lot of houses, caused the perfection in San Francisco. There were a lot of houses that sank into the ground in the moist areas. It had apparently been a very wet year. We don't get a lot of press about it, but there were lots of landslides caused by the 1906 earthquake. And in fact, some of the buildings survived quite well. The engineers, the structural people who had been around and were building the buildings had learned from the Hayward earthquake and done things so that the big buildings in downtown San Francisco survived quite well. The Palace Hotel survived. The um, St. Francis, I think, was under construction, but it was fine. But they all burned in the fire afterwards because, again, there was not the water mains broke. There was no water. The Palace Hotel actually had this water reserve because that was how they got the elevator to go up and down. And they had a hydrant down on the street, and everybody came and hooked a hydrant up and used up the water so that when the fire finally came, the, house, the Palace Hotel burned down. So in this, the lesson from this earthquake was that the fire that can follow earthquakes when the gas mains break and when the water is gone due to ruptures is important. San Francisco, after the fire, put cisterns in the intersections of most of the major streets, but they're discovering that that's also a hazard because sometimes the top collapses. So one of the big lessons from the 1906 earthquake was this fact that it appears that the strain develops over time, stretching, 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 and at some point, like a stretch rubber band, it becomes too much and the ground ruptures. And also what they figured out was that, in fact, the displacement from one earthquake was not enough to account for offsets in geological features along the fault. So that um, there must be many movements recurring on the same fracture by the renewal of strain. So in California where we don't have a terribly long past, but we know we have a seismic hazard, we've been looking for ways to find older evidence of fault. And it's what we call paleoseismology. So we dig these grounds in places where we think we can find evidence. And Tyson's Lagoon, which is um, a park and lake down at the south end near the BART station, there is, there's floods and there's uh, peat and things like that. And so they dig a trench and then they look in the trench for evidence of past earthquakes. And if they don't paint it like this, it's hard to tell what's going on. But what you see is here are faults going up from the bottom all the way to near the surface. So this would be the expression of the most recent earthquake. And here is a fault that goes up and it stops at this brown layer. And so that would be the second, the second youngest fault. And then here, are some faults that go up and end at this pink and the green layers. So that might be the third oldest fault. And then here is this one that goes up and doesn't pass the orange layer. So what we're looking for is evidence of faults that are then covered by more layers that are younger than that fault. And we date them using carbon-14 um, and things like that. And then we can put together a history of when these faults happened and how many years it were in between them. So there was 1906, there was the 1868 earthquake, we know when that one was. And then 
There are past earthquakes, 1725, 1630, plus or minus. So the, the fault here is just centimeters wide? So centimeters. No, the, the trench that they dug was about, so, so this picture is, uh, this is a meter. But the, the actual interface between those yeah, so that moved is really small. But it could have moved in several different places at once. So it's like, so when you rip bread, not cut, rip it, then it rips in various places. But there's eventually one particular place where it goes. So on the one hand, yes, it's sort of a few centimeters wide. Its expression of the surface is a few centimeters wide for any given earthquake. So we can go back now over 2,000 years for the Hayward Fault. This is the 1868 earthquake, and these bars represent the uncertainty for each of the earthquakes in the past. And we can draw a line through them, and the slope of that line will tell us, plus or minus, when the next earthquake will be. The average value is, if we use um, 12 earthquakes, it's 160 years. If we use nine earthquakes, it's 151 years. If we use five earthquakes, it's about 140 years. Plus or minus always, of course, 58 years or so. So we don't know exactly when it's going to happen. It could happen any time. So when will the next one be? We cannot predict earthquakes. All of the times that somebody said, well, before that one, there was this. It happened before, and then we look for it during the next one, and it doesn't happen. So far, there is no way to predict earthquakes. But we can evaluate approximately when the next one is likely to be. And we've been doing that every five years or so since the early 1990s, and put up this map of earthquake probabilities for the whole Bay Area, it's 63% that there will be a big earthquake magnitude 6.7 or greater in the next 30 years. How many years? 30. The reason they use 30 years is because that's something that um, insurance and mortgage companies understand. <laughs> is it going to happen before you pay off your mortgage? Probably. <laughs> From the point of view of which fault is the most likely to go, the Hayward Fault is most likely to go. The Hayward Fault is the Hayward Rogers Creek Fault system. If it's only a Southern Hayward Fault like 1868, then it would be about magnitude 6.8. It could be only a Northern Hayward Fault section, then it might be a 6.5. It could be only on the Rogers Creek Fault, which is north of the bay, then it would be about a 6.5, 6.7. But if the whole thing goes at once, it's going to be around the 7.2. So 
structure from um, essentially the salt and sea towards Los Angeles. That would also be a magnitude 7.8, much like our 1906 scenario. There's these other faults out there that we know very little about, but we're learning more about them by paleo seismology mainly. And I have to say something scary. The San Fernando earthquake happened on fault we didn't know about. The Northridge earthquake happened on fault we didn't know about. And the Coalinga earthquake happened on a fault we didn't know about. So in the last 40 years, 50 years, 50 years I guess, those were the earthquakes that caused a lot of damage. And they were all surprises. So I am Lawson knew if the amount of strain which the Earth will, will endure can be ascertained and the rate at which the crust is creeping has been learned, then we can calculate when and where the next one will happen. And it's, we can calculate where, but not exactly when. So the Hayward Fault is a creeping fault. It creeps at about 10 millimeters per year. Uh, sorry. It creeps at about four millimeters per year. The bad news is it would need to creep at 10 millimeters a year in order not to have an earthquake. There is a section of the San Andreas Fault between Parkfield and, and Hollister that creeps at, we think it creeps at the rate of plate movement. So we don't expect there to be any big earthquakes there. And that's one reason we think that the Southern California earthquakes are going to be separated from the big Northern California earthquakes because there's this region in the middle that's happily moving along at the rate we would like it to happen. There's evidence of uh, creep in the Bay Area. This one, I think, is Hollister. So you can go down to Hollister to a little park in town, and on the north side of the park, you can see the curbs being bent. You can see what we call an echelon of faults in some of the roads where the fault crosses. This is at Prospect and Rose in Hayward. They redid all of the corners except that the geologists begged them, please, not to do the northern corner. So this one is still there. This was in 74. This is in uh, 98. It's moved more since then. And the stadium was kind of offset, too, by the movement at the fault since the time it was built in 1923. So how big will the next one be? This is a movie which I hope it will work. Um, and it shows, it shows the exaggerated ground motion from a Hayward Fault earthquake that starts in Hayward and ruptures northward towards us. So it takes a little while, the blue is the P wave and red is the strong shaking. It takes a little while from the time the earthquake starts for the earthquake waves to get to the surface, which is when we see them. And then the waves spread out and the first the P waves come, the primary waves, they're faster, they're pressure waves. And they don't do damage mostly because they're mostly vertical and most buildings are meant to, most structures are meant to survive vertical. But then comes the S waves, which are shear waves, they're shaking waves, and they're secondary waves, all S, and they do the main shaking. And the other thing you can see is it doesn't stop when the first wave goes by. It keeps on going for a while, shaking and shaking and shaking. So this is 50 seconds after the earthquake started. You want to try it again, too? Yeah. I, the last two earthquakes we felt were just like 3.5. We live in Oakland. And it felt, you know, first you had a kind of a bump. Yes. And then it was nothing. And then you felt the shaking. Mm -hmm. And so it gave you this sense of security or, oh, good, okay, it's done. Even though it was now you're a before the shaking. Right. Now you're a seismologist. <laughs> the P wave comes first. It's a bump. If you feel it, it's a bump. And the um, shaking comes later. If, how much later depends on how far away you are because the waves travel at different rates. Okay. 
you can actually figure out by the difference in time between the bump and the shape where you are. And at 3.5, so the other thing is that if you're close, it's like thunder and it's a clap, so it's short. But the farther away you get, there's dispersion, and so the, the waves are spread out more in time. But we have to convolve that with the fact that earthquakes take time to happen. So for the big earthquake, on the one hand, it will be some time because it's um, the big earthquake, but also some time more depending on how far away you are. One more time. So the P wave comes, reaches the surface after about two seconds, which is typical. I was sitting at home once on a quiet evening and it went bump and I said, oh, that's an earthquake and I'm shaking. And I said, okay. So the, the good news is it was too short. Probably you thought, oh, I should do something. I should get down underneath. Drop, cover, and hold on. The good news is if it's a big earthquake, you'll have plenty of time. If it was too short of time for you to decide this is what you should do, you didn't need to. Unless you're right on top of it. Even if you're right on top of it, you probably have about two seconds. And it's not the initial shake that does the damage. It, you know, if it's a big one, the shaking will go on long enough and probably it will get bigger and bigger. Okay. <coughs> So that 18, if we have a 1868-like earthquake, we expect there'll be about $9 billion in residential damage, maybe seven, uh, sorry, $90 billion, about $75 billion. These numbers go up as time goes on, of course. And the um, $75 billion worth of, of uh, commercial damage. And the problem is, a big problem in California, that. It's not clear how we're going to deal with it because most of this, these losses are uninsured because after Northridge, um, the insurance company bailed. The probabilities are good enough that it's going to happen to us. What happened there? So this is my last slide. Remember to be prepared. The lower Prieta anniversary is coming on Monday. It's always a good time to check your supplies. And on Thursday, the 20th, is the shakeout, which is again a time to remember earthquakes, remember what you're going to do. My opinion is that, yes, you should have the supplies and stuff, but you should have a plan of what you're going to do so that you know when it happens, what you'll do. And it's actually, you know, good thing. So, all right, this is what I'm going to do with my, my clear with my dad. Thank you. On Friday as well, those of you who've been following the predictions of the open preacher, Harold Camping, the Friday's the end of the world, so it really is a good day. So yeah, go home and uh, check where the gas shut off is and make sure I've got lots of bottled water and check my earthquake kit. So, yes, so we buried money in our backyard. <laughs> because, <laughs> no. <laughs> so that, because I figure the money machine's not going to work. And unlike some places, the dollar will still be valued, valued because our neighbors will still use it. Thanks for a very interesting and informative talk. And uh, yes, Dr. Alex, let's uh, any questions. Yes? I was curious about earthquakes that are caused by something other than faults. Uh, I was in that uh, earthquake on the East Coast in August, and I think it was centered somewhere around Virginia, but I felt it up in New Hampshire, for example. Yeah. 
Mina district. One is, of course, that it's built on sand and very moist. And the other is that the waves from the earthquake, on the one hand, they go down and they come back up. But other earthquake waves go down and they run along the surface and they come back up. And in most locations, they don't arrive at the same time. But at about 100 kilometers distance from the source, they do. So on the one hand, there's the, the sand um, problem. But on the other hand, there was additional shaking because there's two sets of waves exacerbating the shaking at the marina district. The other thing is that in Foster City, there weren't that many houses at that time. The, 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 build, the, the Foster City has become much more built up in the last 20 years. And the marine district has already built up. Yes? <coughs> when you look at a fresh cut to the earth, you know, where a freeway goes through the road, and you can see small displacements between the layers of the rocks. What's the significance of those? Are they minor earthquakes? Or? So the, their, um, the magnitude 3 will typically have an offset of 1 centimeter over an area maybe 100 yards across. So there's two answers to that question. One answer is yes, they were probably earth movements. If they happen while the rocks were deep under the ground, you might have measured them. If they happen while it's near the surface, you probably won't because for the waves to get out and go there is, is hard. The, the other question is, you know, was it a quasi road? Was it a slope before? You can have offsets and slopes, slumping kind of landslide things that can cause something like that. You can look at streets and see, you know, offset curves and, and cracks and so on. In Berkeley, most of them are caused by roots and not by earthquake falls. <laughs> so you have to be careful, yes. Um, the bay has been uh, filled in, and I was wondering, uh, Berkeley, how far up from the shoreline is that landfill, and where does the real continent begin? <laughs> okay, so the 5,000 years ago, the bay was a valley and not a bay. And at that point, it was mostly land. Since then, and probably since the um, 1850s, 1860s, when there was all of the hydraulic mining, it's, there's a, a layer of mud, unconsolidated mud on the bottom. And, and, and the shorelines have increased. So the short answer to your question is, I can't tell you exactly where the natural shoreline of the bay is. Um, I know that there has been landfill. I think it's somewhat less in Berkeley than it has been in many of the other places like Hayward and Foster City and so on. But there are maps of that. So the ABAG, the Association of Bay Area Governments, abag.gov, has maps of and liquefaction hazard. Yes? Um, I've read that some human activity, like accumulations of water as a result of the construction of dams, uh, is hypothesized to actually have an impact on the time at which earthquakes, some earthquakes take place. And I'm wondering, if more generally, is there any prospect that ever in the future it will be possible to create earthquakes on demand in order to uh, save people's lives by having people evacuate beforehand, either by lubricating the fault or exploding uh, devices at the faults or any other method? Um, so at any time, it's a hard question <laughs> to answer. <laughs> I would say certainly not in the near future. We don't know much enough about it. The question about small earthquakes obviating the need for big earthquakes, the, the way seismicity occurs is for each magnitude line, on average, there are 10 magnitude eights. And for each magnitude eight, there are an average 10 magnitude sevens. And for each magnitude seven, there are an average 10 magnitude six. Sixes. But in order to make one magnitude seven, we would need 30 magnitude sixes. 
So the question is, could we make them? The answer is, they're not small ones, and the answer is probably not. The other problem is that there have been earthquakes associated with fracking. Uh, so pumping water into the ground and, and, and the geothermal regions. And it's true that there are earthquakes associated with loading from dams. And most of the people who are around them are not very happy about those earthquakes. So if you were trying to make small earthquakes or big enough to remove all of the stress, you might make people unhappy. So there's this horrible question of um, liability for doing that. And if it's an earthquake, it's an act of God. So you can't do anything. But if you try to make the earthquake, then it's your problem. You might try to make five and end up with seven. <laughs> you might try to make a five and end up with seven instead. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, I understand. Um, I don't know how much you know about it, that in the Japan earthquake, there were actually sensors out on the seafloor, and then they detected the earthquake, they were actually initiated a shutdown process for the infrastructure. So, so in fact, um, yes, there were sensors on the seafloor, but they weren't the ones. That was, so there's an earthquake early warning system in Japan, and we were working on one with our partners at Caltech and the USGS for California, we're not as far along because we didn't put as much instrumentation in. But so the the Japanese early warning was based on the P waves arriving at the shore and sensors on the shore. And for the people in the epicentral region, the people there where those sensors were, the warning was about eight seconds before the shaking started. The um, the trains are shut down by sensors by that system and by separate sensors along the track. So, so all of the Shinkansen trains slowed down. Nobody was hurt. There was no damage to those tracks. There was damage to other train tracks closer to shore, but from the tsunami and not from the shaking. So that's it's called an earthquake early warning system. We're working on it. In order for it to go public like the Japanese one did, we would have to have a lot more investment in infrastructure and people and we're working on, you know, how do you get the message out? And the Japanese have solved that problem. They could piggyback on their methods, but we still don't have enough infrastructure to be able to do it. Yes? Somebody else asked that question. Okay. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes? There's the Hosky Fault down in, uh, near San Luis Obispo, I mentioned. What's the probability of that one uh, cause an earthquake? That um, so the Hosby Fault, as I know it, what I know about the Hosby Fault, which is not definitive, um, it could have a magnitude 6 or 6.5. And we don't really know about the probability yet because we don't have any paleoseismological evidence and we don't really have any um, seismicity evidence. So one way to find out about probabilities is to look for historical evidence of earthquakes or prehistorical, and we don't have that. We only know that the fault is there. And I know that uh, PG&E is putting in new equipment to monitor it better, to figure out in better detail what the probability of going is. My understanding is that the, the shaking that would be expected from a magnitude six fault at the location of the Osprey fault is less than the shaking that would be expected from a um, 1857 type Fort earthquake on the San Andreas Fault. And that's what the Diablo Canyon is built to withstand. That's my understanding. Yes? Um, I want you to explain further the fault on the in the east because there's no known there. Yeah, so. It turns out that wherever there are mountains, there are faults. In order to get mountain building, you need to have some kind of thrust faulting. And there are, so there are obviously old faults there. Why do they pop off? We don't have an answer to that question yet. So there are faults also at the Madrid 
in the middle of the continent. And the hypotheses that I have heard are that this was an old um, spreading center millions of years ago. And the pushing, so the North American plate is pushing westward from the ocean ridge. And of course, it's hitting the Pacific plate. So inside of the plate overall, we imagine only stuff happens at the edge. But of course, if you bend the ruler or the pencil, then there's still stress building up in the middle. That's smaller. And eventually, if you bend the pencil too much, it breaks in the middle. And so the one of the thoughts is that this region in the middle is a region where the pneumatic earthquake happened, is a region that's a little bit weak. And so it's the crackling in the pencil before it finally breaks. But it takes many years to build up enough stress for that to happen. The, um, the Virginia Falls, I really don't know how, sorry. But you can send me an email and I'll try and find out if you like. So you had a question. How reliable, uh, or what is the effect of political uh, factors uh, on the earthquake uh, probability that are will be intense, particularly around the intensity? And I ask because I spoke recently with a retired seismologist at the state agency. Mm -hmm. and he told me the story of how his figures had been purposely changed by power to be in Sacramento because of the consequences of what? Um, so I'm not part of the, the, there's a team called the use of the Uniform California Earthquake um, Rupture Forecast, who produced the information that went into these maps that I showed you. And the scientists that I know who are on that team, I think of as being fairly politically incorruptible. But I could not know them very well. So I, I think the answer is that overall, these, these numbers are pretty good now. The ones that I wish I That's maybe the best I could do. Why not? Don't you apologize to get back to our car or uh, the police do. Take a